Good morning, and welcome to our service of morning prayer this morning on this very ridiculously cold January 14th morning. We're so happy you're able to join us, and thank you all for understanding why we thought it was so important for your safety, our safety, everyone's safety, to move this service to an online format this morning. The church is still struggling to even get to 15 degrees, so I hope wherever you are watching from, you're a little warmer than that, and you're comfortable. Again, we're so happy to have you. Please take a moment or two as we prepare our hearts as we enter into morning prayer for this second Sunday after Epiphany. Lord, open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory, Glory to, to the, the Father, Father and, and to the Son, and and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is our refuge and strength. O come, let us worship. Let us pray together the Jubilate. Be, be joyful in the Lord, Lord all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from age to age. The Lord is our refuge and strength. O come, let us worship. Our first reading today is taken from the third chapter of the first book of Samuel. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak for your servant is listening. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And we will now do Psalm 139. I will do the light print and everyone is, should respond with the bold print. Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You trace my journeys and my resting places, and are acquainted with all my ways. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips but you, O Lord, know it altogether. You press upon me behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain to it. For you yourself created my inmost parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will thank you because I am marvelously made. Your works are wonderful. 
and I know it well. My body was not hidden from you, while I was being made in secret and woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my limbs, not yet not unfinished, in the womb. All of them were written in your book. They were fashioned day by day, when as yet there were none of them. How deep I find your thoughts, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I were to count them, they would be more in number than the sun, sand. To count them all, my lifespan would need to be like yours. Our second reading for today is say, taken from the sixth chapter of the first book of Corinthians. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and stomach for the food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, the two shall be one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body. But the fornicator sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? which you have from God, and that you are not your own. For you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Peter said to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Loving God, thank you that you long for us to hear your voice. Help us to not only hear you calling us to follow, but to walk in your footsteps each day so that we might experience the abundant life you promise. Amen. Amen. Have any of you ever been in a conversation with someone only to realize partway through that conversation that one of you isn't really listening? Or at least somewhere along the way, one of you has gotten lost or has been unable to follow the thread of the conversation? I must admit that I have been in conversations where my attention has drifted off or my mind has been somewhere else and I have tried to fake it like I've been following along. Typically, when I try to fake it, it doesn't turn out well, especially with Danielle, 
who is great at calling me out in order to get me back to where my focus belongs. When this happens to me, I have found that it is better to simply confess to the person that I am talking with that I haven't really been following as closely as I should have been, that I don't actually know what they have been talking about. It is a bit embarrassing, but by apologizing, it allows for the conversation to continue with only the need for a brief recap to occur. Usually for me, I find that my ability to be present in a conversation is directly related to the level of tiredness I am experiencing. When I'm really tired, it is more difficult to pay attention, to keep focus, to be fully present. I remember when I was doing chaplaincy work at the Royal Alec Hospital, where I occasionally was on call for 72 hours straight, often with only a few hours of sleep each night. If I was paged at 3 a.m., it took a few minutes to actually have my ears fully connected to my brain so that I could be fully present for people. Perhaps that is why I relate to, Samuel's, to Samuel in today's passage. I fully understand what it is like to try to pay attention to what is being said after being startled awake. Being awoken suddenly results in requiring a few extra moments or minutes to get to the point of consciousness that allows for the brain to connect the dots in a conversation. To make it even more challenging for Samuel is the fact that he is probably a teenager when he is called by God to be a prophet. And as most of us have experienced, either as a teenager ourselves or trying to talk to a teenager, it is sometimes a difficult endeavor to have a meaningful conversation, either late at night or first thing in the morning. Teenagers need their sleep even more than adults, so waking them up unexpectedly should only be done in extreme circumstances. Imagine trying to have a deep, thoughtful conversation with a teenager who has just been woken up from either a deep sleep or even a nap. Not something that most of us would put on our bucket list of must do. Well, anyways, Samuel is woken up. He is startled with a voice calling out his name. Once the brain fog clears, he remembers that only Eli is around. So it is natural for him to assume that it must be his mentor who has called out for him. In fact, I don't know about you, but if I heard a voice as I was coming out of my dream state, I would assume it was the voice of someone I lived with. So it doesn't seem surprising to me that Samuel would go to Eli. After the first time where Eli declares he didn't call Samuel, there are two more times when Samuel hears a voice that he decides must be Eli. Perhaps Samuel thinks that Eli is playing a trick on him. Perhaps Samuel thinks that this must be some kind of test. Regardless of what Samuel was thinking, what we know is that Samuel doesn't recognize God's voice. Now, before we start to shake our heads at the slowness of Samuel to recognize that it wasn't Eli calling him, we need to understand what is actually happening here. In the passage, we are told, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. So at this point, the one who was to become a prophet, to speak on behalf of God, does not know God. Thus, not recognizing God's voice seems like the reasonable, even expected response for Samuel. The question that we should be asking is not the one of judgment, wondering how Samuel couldn't recognize God's voice. The better question is asking, how will Samuel recognize the voice of God? We need to remember that Samuel, who had been dedicated to the service of God by his mother at birth, lived in the temple at Shiloh under the supervision of Eli. This meant that Samuel was a student he was being guided, being taught about God. But until he heard the voice of God, until he had a personal encounter with God, Samuel had no way of recognizing God's voice. It was Eli who finally understood that it was God speaking to Samuel, God calling out to Samuel. Yet it took Eli three times before he figured it out. Thankfully, God is not the one-and-done type. 
God's love is stubborn. God does not ever give up, which is good news for Samuel and us. Now, once Eli knew what was happening, he knew how to assist Samuel. Eli told Samuel exactly how to respond to the voice. It was not left for Samuel to begin the dialogue with God, as it is not even clear that Samuel at this point understood that it was God speaking to him. What is intriguing to me regarding this initial exchange between God and Samuel is the ordinariness of it. God doesn't speak in some secret code. God doesn't require Samuel to know some secret or hidden message. God is simply saying, hi, and all that is required of Samuel is to say, hi, back. It is only after Samuel says hi, signaling that he is listening, that God enters into a more intense conversation. And it should be remembered that Samuel, although still young, had already been in training for almost a decade with Eli. There is a foundation and understanding about God that allowed Samuel to take the conversation seriously. Yet this was the beginning, not the end of a lifetime of conversations. The start of an intimate relationship that would see Samuel become a spokesperson for God, a prophet and leader for Israel. This story of Samuel makes me wonder about the calling by Jesus of the first disciples. The first disciples would have been similar to Samuel in that they would have grown up with the stories of how Yahweh had been with the Jewish people guiding and providing for them. They would have been familiar with the story celebrated at Passover where God freed their ancestors and made Israel a mighty nation. They would have been part of the people who were longing for a Messiah, longing to set, be set free, longing for Yahweh to act again. Add to this understanding the work of John the Baptist, the one who announced the coming of the long-awaited Messiah. John declared that everything people were longing for, that everything people were had waited for, had come with Jesus. John the Baptist was to the first disciples what Eli was to Samuel. They were both charged by God to point people in the right direction. They were both told people who, who to listen to, the voice they should pay attention to if they wanted to experience the divine. In today's gospel reading, Jesus makes simple invitations that can be accepted or rejected. Come and see and follow me are really low risk invites. There is no initial request for commitment. There is only an invitation to come and check out what is happening. It is an invitation that goes out to those who are seeking, those who are curious, those who are questioning, even those who are doubting. When Philip invites Nathaniel to check out Jesus, Nathaniel, and probably one of the more subtle insults in scripture, asks with more than a little bit of sarcasm, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It is a remark regarding the backwardness of Nazareth a hick rural town that produced no one of importance. Philip, a city boy himself, who might have had the same thoughts to begin with, tells Nathaniel to hold off making any judgments until he has personally encountered Jesus, basically to not throw out the baby with the bathwater. It is only after Nathaniel accepts the invitation, similar to how it was only after Samuel accepted the invitation that Nathanael is blown away by Jesus. For you see, it is only as we encounter God that we will learn to recognize God's voice. But it is crucial that we remember that we are never called to recognize God's voice in a vacuum. We are never called to discern God's will on our own. Samuel had Eli, someone to guide him, to teach him, to journey with him along the way of discovery. Samuel spent years learning about God, spent years deepening his relationship with God in order to recognize God's voice. There were no shortcuts in preparing Samuel for his role in God's plan to speak to the people of Israel on behalf of God. Nathaniel and the other first disciples had Jesus 
who guided them, taught them, journeyed with them on the way of discovery. They spent years with Jesus seeing God in action. They spent years with Jesus literally listening to God's voice. And they still got it wrong, often, both when Jesus was walking with them and after they were given the Holy Spirit to guide them. So how do we recognize God's voice? How do we discern God's will? For me, the stories of Samuel and the calling of the first disciples tell us two important things. First, that sometimes God is right in front of us and we still miss out. Second, that is only listening with others that we can be sure it is God speaking. We recognize God's voice. We understand God's movement in our lives only through living lives that are open to God while journeying with others along the way. It requires us to be open to God, open to the unexpected, open to new things, open to change. For God loves us too much to leave us as infants. God wants us to mature, to grow into the people we were created to be, people who love extravagantly, forgive abundantly, and forgive abundantly, and give generously, mirroring what God does for us. May God give us the courage to respond to God's voice the way that Samuel and the first disciples responded, so that not only our lives, but our world is turned upside down by love. Amen. Amen. And now let us affirm our faith in the words of hear, O Israel. Hear, hear O Israel. Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, Lord our, our God. God. The, the Lord, Lord is one. one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and the great commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. I invite you to assume whatever posture you find most prayerful as we enter, as we enter into the prayers of the people. In response to, Lord, in your mercy, please respond with, hear yeah. our prayer. And today I'd like to give a special thank you to our lay reader, Marion Allen. She was on for doing the intercess intercessions today, and she has graciously sent me her prayers so that we can share them with you. So with that, let us enter into the prayers of the people. Let us pray. O oh God, you spoke your word and revealed your good news in Jesus the Christ. Fill all your creation with that word again, so that by proclaiming your joyful promises to all nations and singing of your glorious hope to all peoples, we may become one living body, your incarnate presence on earth. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O oh God, as we experience the most intense cold weather of this winter, we remember everyone struggling to survive on the streets, in encampments, or anywhere they can find to stay warm. Help us to be more generous in meeting the needs of the unhoused and in accepting their right to survive in conditions that few of us would choose. Help us to remember that God knows and values each of us as unique human beings. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We also remember everyone affected by the terrors and hardships of war, especially in Gaza, Israel, Ukraine, and Russia. Give both combatants and civilians the courage to hope for a better future. Help them to find creative ways to balance the desire for justice and the need for peace, and thus to bring war to an end. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray today for the Diocese of Athabasca, the Right Reverend David Greenwood Bishop. We pray for the Diocese of Edmonton Educational Chaplaincy. 
In the Bouillet Diocese, we pray for St. John Parish and their rector, Damascene, and their deputy rector, Deo. We pray for all First Nations peoples, and especially today for the Enoch Cree Nation. Here at Holy Trinity, we pray for the office team and the clergy team, for John and our music ministry, for our kids' church, and for the equally Anglican ministry. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of every land and nation, you have created all people, and you dwell among us in Jesus Christ. Listen to the cries of those who pray to you and grant that as we proclaim the greatness of your name, all of us will know the power of your love at work in the world. Bring healing to all wounds. Make whole all that is broken. Speak truth to all illusion and shed light into every darkness that all creation will see your glory and know your name. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Let us lift our hearts in faith to the one who hears all prayers and holds close those in need. Today, we remember everyone in hospitals, long-term care facilities, rehab facilities, and group homes and their friends and families. Help them to find the faith to accept the challenges of their circumstances and the courage to hope for strength and improvement. Today, we remember those on our parish prayer list, Roger, Ed, Gertrude, Margaret Ann and family, Mildred, Bill and family, Barbara, Michael, Colleen and family, Roy, Bruno and family, Jose, Jacqueline, and Denise. We hold in prayer those who have died, remembering especially today Walter and Sandra. May their souls through the mercy of God rest in peace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Insistent God, by day and night you summon your sleeping people. So stir us with your voice and enlighten our lives with your face, that we give ourselves fully to Christ's call to mission and service. Amen. And now let us pray the collect of the day. Almighty God, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world. May your people, illumined by your word, shine in the, with the radiance of his glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord's face shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord look upon us with favor and grant us peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for understanding why we're coming at you via online. And we look forward to worshiping with you in person next week. Until then, stay safe, stay warm, and God bless all of you.